as Brenda mentioned, I will be talking about creating novel materials from poultry byproducts. And I want to start on a lighter note. So I have uh, a riddle for you. Um, there was an old man and uh, he had 17 horses. And before he passed away, he left a will for his sons. He had three sons. So he wrote in the will that his eldest son will get half of the horses, middle son will get one third, and the youngest will get, get one ninth. Now he has total 17 horses. If you have to help him divide those horses, what would you do or how would you help him? Okay, so you can think of that and we can start the presentation. So I generally ask questions there has been several technologies who transformed, um, it brought a revolutionary transformation in our life. And if we have to pick one, which really uh, transformed the human life we live now, uh, that is the use of energy. Now, the use of energy, if you think of, um, we are using in the form of fuels, we are using electricity or uh, if you think of, let's say, a decade back when uh, we discovered the fossil fuels, before that, um, we were living separately and transportation or traveling was um, very limited. And with the discovery of fossil fuels, we expanded the use of energy and now we can travel the distances uh, which were covered in months and years in days or, or hours. And that is because of the fossil fuels. And if you think of where do the fossil fuels come from, um, obviously it took millions of years for those to be created and we mine them and use them. Now these are limited resources and um, there are predictions that they may last for 50 or 100 years and if we do not find new resources, then we are uh, leading towards depletion of these resources. And we take these resources, we define them, and we produce different type of materials from there. For example, we use uh, them for the fuel applications, uh, starting from refinery gas to, you can see, fuel oil for ships, and there is a small fraction, we call it naphtha fraction. That fraction is used for making different types of materials. For example, plastics, uh, cosmetics, or uh, clothing, or those kind of applications. And if we have to look at the uh, similar transformation, now this, this process is petrol refining. We take petroleum or fossil resources, we define them and we produce different type of materials. And there is an urge to move towards biorefining. That means we can take uh, renewable resources and process them and produce materials so that we are ready for transition. If we are out of uh, fossil resources, we can move to renewable resources. And currently we take our products and use them for food or food ingredients. Um, we are currently making also uh, different type of pharmaceuticals or the biofuels you may have heard of. Uh, those fuels are coming from renewable resources. And if we do right chemistry, we can also produce different type of materials from these renewable resources. And some of them are being produced. So transition from petro uh, refining or petro economy or fossil fuel economy to, towards bio-based economy uh, is possible, but it's challenging. And if you look at the resources for the uh, fossil fuel economy, we have petroleum, natural gas, or coal. And if we take renewable resources, we can use carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins, and we can produce materials from there. Now, it took 100 years for uh, fossil fuel based resources to get here. These renewable resources, which we are talking about, uh, 
they are they are emerging now. They're starting now, and so the competition is tough. Uh, fossil fuel-based resources, non-renewable resources are really uh, strong. They are established, and the renewable or sustainable uh, resources which we are talking about are not established, and there are challenges associated with that. Uh, major challenges are the food and feed um, competition with the materials and fuels, for example. If we talk about first generation feedstocks, that means that we are using these resources for a material or fuel application, but they can be used by humans and or animals for their food. So there is a competition. Um, then we think of some resources which can be produced by using the land, but they are not consumed by uh, humans, for example, we call them second generation uh, feedstocks, but still they are using land and they are competing with. Um, third generation feedstocks are those which are byproducts, for example, which are not competing with food or feed um, applications. And also uh, some of those can be um, the core byproducts for agricultural industry, uh, port industry, and also, for example, uh, other, um, other materials which do not use land or do not compete with the uh, food or feed uh, for animals or humans. Now, poultry byproducts can be considered under third generation uh, feedstocks because they are core byproducts. They are not used for uh, feed or food ingredients, or if they are used for feed or food ingredients, uh, they are not economically viable. So two major uh, components can be proteins and lipids. And I will give you a couple of examples of proteins, uh, how do we use them and uh, lipids. So I start with spent hens and we have quite a few spent hens here in uh, North America and worldwide. Now, what we did is we took the spent hen and we ground that and extracted lipids and proteins. The lipid extraction was carried out using microwaves. I'll give you some details on the microwaves in the coming slides. Uh, optimization led to about 98% recovery in 10 minutes using 80 degrees Celsius temperature, uh, which is lower than generally uh, we can use for conventional extraction. And if you look at the, at the lipids, mostly we have triglycerides. So we have glycerol and fatty acids linked to it. And fatty acids are different uh, in different triglycerides. So we have saturated or unsaturated fatty acids. And we did transesterification. That means we removed glycerin and fatty esters separated from glycerin. Now glycerin, I will um, give you an example of what we did with glycerin. Uh, glycerin is also produced by the biofuel or oleochemical industry because they take these fatty acids and produce glycerin as a core byproduct because it has some um, catalysts or acids or bas bases in there. So they cannot be used for, for uh, generally food or pharmaceutical applications. Therefore, it's also called byproduct and or co-product of the uh, fossil, uh, sorry, fuel or biofuel or oleochemical industry. So we did the composition analysis for the fatty acids present in the lipids and uh, we had oleic acid higher percentage, 50 to 60%. Uh, and then we had some other uh, unsaturated fatty acids. Now, we started with the tag itself and we functionalized it by oxidizing it. Uh, this oxidation was done uh, without any solvent. Generally, organic solvents are used. Uh, we did it without any solvent. And that epoxidized tags were actually functionalized with CNC. So this, these are cellulose and crystals which are commonly used uh, to reinforce. But the issue is that 
and their dispersion is a big challenge. So we, we thought to incorporate them and uh, link them on the surface. And then we functionalized the remaining surfaces with cross-linkable mites or polymerizable functional groups. And then we polymerized it and converted into films. So you can see one example here, uh, a film prepared from these uh, triglycerides. We also took these uh, fatty acids and uh, basically we trans-sterified those uh, tags and converted to fatty acids, functionalized those fatty acids and polymerized them to make polymers. We reinforced them with uh, the nanoclay and made these films. Um, these films had very good properties uh, for to be used for packaging application, for example. Now, one important aspect of the conversion of renewables is that the petrochemical industry uses metathesis chemistry. That means, um, metathesis means that we put in different orders. So you take two different um, materials together, components together, and they can react with each other and you produced two different products from there. We have uh, two different routes for metathesis. This is something maybe complicated for you. I'm trying to make it simple. Cross and self metathesis. So self metathesis is, for example, if we are taking two similar fatty acids and we're putting them together, we will get products from there. If we are taking two different fatty acids or different functional compounds and put them together, they should have double bonds. We will be getting different products from there. Now, petrochemical industry uses this process very, uh, very commonly. They take these um, petrochemicals, hydrocarbons, and similar thing with lipids is that they are also hydrocarbons. Now, they use them to make different uh, products. For example, they use it in Philips triolefin process they make different type of oligomers. They're used in a variety of different applications. Um, and neohexanes, for example, they use in musk perfumes, uh, shell higher olefin process to make different type of oligomers and polymers from there. This process has been tried also for renewable feedstocks. And the, the renewable feedstocks we can use olefin metathesis and make individual or integrated products. If we are able to make integrated products, that means we can mimic biorefinery concept. So lipids are considered really good source for this process because they are available on larger scale. Uh, they have multiple functional groups which can be exploited and we, we can produce multiple products from there. If we produce multiple products from there, that means it's a good fit for biorefining. And once the current uh, process which has been tried is using a purified methyl olate, for example, as a model substrate and using this ethenolysis process to, to convert into uh, products the, the challenge has been that the catalyst they use is decomposes because they had to use higher temperature and therefore the process does not become viable on larger scale. So what we did is we used microwaves instead of conventional heating and microwaves, as you know, they are uh, electromagnetic radiations between radio waves and infrared. And they have both electromagnetic, uh, electric and magnetic field if you take your um, starting material and you irradiate it, this works only for the polar species. If you put water in the microwave, you will see within a few seconds it becomes very hot. But if you put hexane, for example, which is non-polar, you put in the microwave, you heat it, it doesn't happen. It will stay cold, nothing happens. So if you have polar species like, like uh, lipids, then the microwaves, if you put under the microwaves, they tend to align themselves along the changing electric field. And because electric field changes so rapidly, 2.45 billion times per second, so that's so fast, they cannot keep up with that changing rapid field and they start heating with each other. And that's where rapidly temperature goes up. 
reaction takes place very fast. So this is how microwaves work. So we used uh, microwaves to convert different uh, lipids. We used this uh, chicken fat, for example, we used uh, canola oil, we used uh, uh, the waste cooking oil, which is used for frying, for example. Uh, we used the methyl esters from there using microwave, we converted them into different products. And you can see here some of the products uh, after, after the uh, metathesis process. So we got hydrocarbons, terminal hydrocarbons, internal hydrocarbons, esters, and they are used in a variety of different applications. So you can see here, this is one example of the GCMS of the chicken fat before ethenolysis or metathesis and after ethenolysis. And we got all the products I showed you before. Now, this process, we um, started a spin off company um, on this. So uh, this company, um, we did a scale up. Uh, you can see, we started in milliliter scale on the lab, and then we did on liter scale in the lab. Uh, that was a bigger reactor. And this is the biggest uh, we do up to 10 liter uh, process uh, for the production of different uh, material yeah. from there. The second is the poultry feather. So I'll give you a couple of examples of poultry feather. Um, we have quite a few poultry feathers produced in Canada because um, the poultry processing uh, generates a lot of feathers. Mostly they are landfilled. Um, and so this is a core byproduct. And so in this part, I'll give you example, utilization of the fiber directly for composite applications. And uh, we functionalize the fibers uh, for the composite application. And we also use saturated fatty acids. Uh, do you remember we, I mentioned that metathesis process only converts the unsaturated fatty acids. The saturated fatty acids, we functionalize them and we co-polymerize them with styrene to make a polymer and use that polymer uh, and reinforce with these fibers from, uh, from the poultry uh, feathers. Now, poultry feather is advantageous because the fibers are now being used for the production of composites, for example, you might have seen uh, the building materials, they use fibers. Um, so the, the conventional fibers were synthetic fibers, which coming from uh, fossil fuel resources. Now they are being replaced with the biofibers generally are from plant-based fibers. And those plant-based fibers have issues. Poultry feather uh, fibers are really strong, but they also have some issues. Now the advantage they have compared to other fibers that they are non-abrasive, uh, they are biodegradable, eco-friendly, uh, they are not soluble in organic solvents. Uh, we can get uh, more consistent quality of fibers compared to the plant fibers, for example. And therefore they have good chance to, to be used in composite applications. However, the issue with them is that they do not get well along with the polymers because polymers are generally hydrophobic. And so they can be pulled out uh, and they also have a challenge of high flammability. So for, for example, for internal applications or where there uh, is a chance for, for fire, they catch fire quickly and easily and therefore they have a uh, flammability, they, they absorb moisture, and they have poor adhesion between fiber and matrix. So in order to address this issue, what we did is we functionalized the surface of these fibers with nanoparticles, we call them PAS. It's a polyhedral oligomeric silicious QOGs. And you can see here an uh, example of these two PAS molecules. So we actually uh, initiated the uh, functional groups on the surface of the fiber, and we copolymerized it with the pass to add pass on the surface, and then ungrafted pass was extracted. Uh, we characterized it using different characterization techniques. You can see one example here, XPS, uh, where it shows the silica 
of the past molecules and it also shows that the ester linkages uh, which were produced after the grafting. Uh, we looked at this using the SEM. You can see here, SEM does not show really very big difference, but this is the neat fiber. Uh, this is the fiber with, uh, with the surface modified. You can see some, some bumps on the surface, but in order to characterize further, we use TEM. And with the TEM, we were able to see that there are uh, pass molecules on the surface. For example, using EDS, we were able to find out the con high concentration of silica at the sites where we see the grafting. Uh, the secondly, we also did that we uh, used nanoclay to reinforce. We dissolved the fiber uh, feathers and inc incorporated nanoclay, and then uh, we wet spin it into make fiber again. We used two different clays. One was modified and one was unmodified. And we uh, reinforced and produced wet spin fibers from there. And those fibers were used to reinforce. So you can see here, these are two different uh, um, unmodified and modified clay reinforced fiber transmission electron microscopes. You can see here uh, some of the layers of the clay incorporated. The thermal stability of these um, materials were investigated using uh, the thermal gravimetric analysis. You can see after the reinforcement, we had a higher thermal stability compared to the knee fiber and about 15, 20, up to 40 degrees Celsius difference. Another improvement we saw was moisture uptake. You can see moisture uptake for the fiber is about 60%. And after the modification, we get to about 15%. So you can see is a big difference in the moisture uptake. Then we took that uh, polymer and uh, we made the monomer. You can see here, we take uh, saturated fatty acid, we functionalized it and made a monomer. And then this monomer was copolymerized with styrene to make a polymer and use that polymer and reinforce with the fiber modified fibers to make composites. And you can see here the difference in the SEM after the composites. You can see here, uh, generally the, the fibers are pulled out, but in this case, they are not pulled out. Uh, they are actually, they break down when we um, uh, do the mechanical testing. Uh, those which are the ones which are modified, the unmodified obviously could be pulled out and we did study the flammability of these composites because flammability is, is a major issue. Um, we gave a flame for uh, this. There is a standard method to give a flame for a few seconds. It's a fraction of a second. And then uh, the, we wait for the uh, material to catch fire. So you can see uh, the neat fiber, it, based composites, they caught fire on first flame. The others, they actually caught fire basically, and then uh, that was put off. And then on the second flame, they got fired. So there was a improvement in the delay uh, of catching fire. You can see about 30 to 35 seconds. Uh, so that's a, that's a big difference if we think of on a larger scale. And secondly, we also used the combination or two different uh, reinforcement, like for example, uh, cellulose nanocrystals or uh, montmorillonite clay to make composites and films from there uh, for packaging applications. I'll give you a second example of uh, feathers being used for uh, the treatment of water. Now, water treatment is a big issue. Um, the water has quite a different type of contaminants. It has arsenic, it has metals, it has organics, it has also uh, microbial contaminations. So we initially started with the arsenic uh, to remove arsenic, mostly drinking water has arsenic in some of the developing countries. Um, and then we moved it to the more uh, water associated problem 
here in Alberta, which is the oil sand tailings and the extraction of bitumen, for example, they use water. So we um, used this material, basically, we modified this material or fine-tuned this material to, to remove multiple contaminants, especially from the um, oil sand process affected water and the tailing consolidation. Now I give you an example of how this water is used. Now the fresh water which is taken for this process is from Athabasca River. And that water is used um, to extract the bitumen. Now we have two different processes. One is surface mining and one is in situ. Surface mining means uh, they take this clay with the bitumen and they dissolve in hot water. And then they take that uh, bitumen separated and then water with other contaminants is left, which they put into tailing ponds. And you might have seen these big tailing ponds if you go to Core Lake area or, or uh, where the, the mining is being done. And those tailing ponds, huge ponds, they settle down parsley and some of the water is released to the surface. And that water is then taken out from there, mixed with the fresh water. So generally, if we are talking about one barrel of bitumen being produced, uh, about seven to 12 barrels of water is used. And most of the time, two to three barrels fresh water is also used. So you can see here how much water is being used to extract the bitumen. There are two issues with this water. Uh, they cannot release into the other water bodies or uh, they, that needs to be kept there because it has contaminants. Uh, contamin contaminants of concern are the metals and naphthenic acids, which are organic acids, and th those are toxic. So they cannot release this water. Secondly, they cannot use totally this water because it becomes saturated with the contaminants and therefore its recovery efficiency goes down. So this, this process needs to be, um, to be tuned in a way that water is treated and also the tailings needs to be consolidated so that land can be reused. And these are two major issues, so water treatment and tailing consolidation. Now, keratin uh, from feathers is protein. It's a cross-linked protein, basically high percentage of cysteine residues. And we actually uh, modified this keratin, um, ground it, and then uh, dissolve it. We did two different types of modification, surface or in situ. And you can see this cross-linked keratin becomes loose, um, unraveled, and that can be used for the treatment of uh, removal of metals, for example, uh, for the removal of arsenic. We initially used arsenic-3 as basically more toxic and difficult to remove. Uh, we were able to remove that arsenic um, at different pHs, for example, 4, 7, 14. And you can see the uh, percent removal uh, was about 80% or, or sometimes higher. And we modified uh, this uh, feather-based zarbins to make them fit for multiple metal removal and also for the removal of naphthenic acids. Now, here is example of multiple metal removal uh, from contaminated water. You can see here uh, the removal of metals. Uh, for example, we tested for uh, eight metals initially. Uh, you can see the removal on two different pHs, 7.5, 5.5. Um, you can see about 80, 90% removal, in some cases, 100% removal of metal. And this is the further expansion. We used it for nine different metals at two different pHs, and we were able to remove from 40 to 80 or 90% of the metals, uh, which is generally, um, now we are under the uh, metal toxicity requirement if we remove uh, 70, 60% of the metals from the water. 
we used it for the oil sand process affected water. So you can see here, oil sand process affected water, uh, we were able to remove completely. And then we actually uh, spiked with additional metals to see how effectively we can remove further metals. Uh, we also removed naphthenic acids up to 60 to 80%. And these naphthenic acids and metals, both are issue for the oil sand process affected water, which is recycled. If we remove that, uh, it will be more efficient and therefore less likely to use fresh water. So this is another example where we saw that it not only removes part of metals, but also converts them into less toxic form, for example, vanadium three to two. Um, and we tested its absorption capacity, how many uh, milligrams of metal we can absorb uh, per gram of this material. Uh, we saw up to 17 milligram per gram. That means we can treat huge volumes of water because concentrations are very low compared to uh, this high absorption capacity. Uh, we used these, modified them and used for consolidation of tailings. So consolidation of tailings is, so when they take this mixture, uh, which has clay and silt and all the uh, water contaminated and they put in the tailing ponds, the expectation is that the clay and settles down and water comes up and so water can be re removed and clay can be remediated or that land can be remediated. So they need certain consolidation before uh, this can be used uh, for any kind of remediation purposes. And consolidation does not happen because of the mixture where there is uh, some bitumen left, uh, clay, silt, and other mixture. So most of the time they use uh, currently, they use polyacrylamide. It's a synthetic polymer to, to consolidate to some extent. And so one of the issues is that with the polyacrylamide, it's um, high concentrations are required, very high concentrations are required. And also the fate is unknown. So it, if it degrades to acrylamide, which is toxic, and so um, replacement or use of something which is natural or less toxic and also gives better results is highly desirable. We did comparison uh, with the polyacrylamide. So this is a polyacrylamide. Here we have unamended uh, this um, tailing. And then we had these uh, biopolymer from keratin. You can see here, uh, the consolidation is much better compared to polyacrylamide and also water clarity is much better in certain cases. So you can see here, this is up to 160 days consolidation. The water uh, percent consolidation for a couple of, so you can see here, this is acrylamide, which gives up to maybe 15% of the consolidation. We can get up to 35% consolidation with some of the modified uh, keratin biopolymers. And here is the water release. So you can see here, water release with the acrylamide is about 10%. We can get up to 30% water release, which is higher water release. And also it consolidates and removes the uh, naphthenic acid as well as metals. So water is much, much clearer compared to uh, the, the polyacrylamide based consolidation, for example. Uh, with the help of COSIA, we did a couple of uh, bigger trials. Uh, it's 10 liter uh, columns. And we saw that the consolidation was much faster uh, compared to uh, the, the clay. The, the um, tailings have different percentages of solid contents. This is where 10, 12% of the solid content is. The mature fine tailing has higher percentages. The higher percentages settle less quickly compared to the low percent tailing. And this is, you can see here, a very quick settling within 35 days when we use uh, 10 liter columns. Now, if you remember, I said, I will give you example of glycerine conversion. And uh, glycerine is, is a co or byproduct of the uh, process we developed uh, for 
or the biodiesel industry or oleochemical industry produces glycerin. It's about 10% weight by weight. Uh, they cannot use it for uh, pharmaceutical or cosmetic applications because purification costs are more than the revenue they will generate. So uh, that they become expensive to purify. So what we did is we converted this glycerin to um, a monomer, which is a lilac monomer, and then functionalize it to make uh, further uh, polymer from here, this polymer polyacrylic acid, or we functionalized it to make um, the uh, acrylic uh, phthalate and po produce polymer from there. These polymers are used for different applications, uh, especially in the diapers or high absorbent applications. Uh, so we actually did optimize the conditions to produce um, acrylic, uh, acrylyl alcohol and ester from there and then polymerized it and used them uh, for the consolidation of tailings. Uh, for example, I gave you an example before uh, using a feather-based absorbent. Uh, we also used this polyacrylamide or polyacrylamide formate-based uh, absorbent you can see here the consolidation is much higher. Um, water release is better compared to the palm. So we have different type of materials uh, which can be used uh, to produce um, polymers which are highly effective uh, for the consolidation of tailings. And this tailings is a big issue uh, for Alberta because bitumen is, is being extracted here. So in summary, I would say that the poultry byproducts, uh, they can be a big resource for uh, material development. We can develop new materials from there. Um, we can produce polymers. We can produce specialty chemicals. Uh, they're used in cosmetics. They're used in packaging or other applications. For example, zarbents for water treatment or consolidation of tailings. Uh, some of the zarbents are highly effective uh, they can remove multiple contaminants and they consolidate tailings uh, very effectively. And uh, this could be a very effective water treatment option because we have tested them for the tailing ponds, for the um, oil sand process affected water, as well as the synthetic water for other industries uh, where trace metals are really a big issue. So there's a big potential for uh, using these kind of sorbents. And we've done some scale up, but we are currently doing uh, scale up for the absorption uh, technology with the future energy systems. And hopefully we'll see application of this technology in future. I'd like to acknowledge group members, collaborators, funding agencies, and thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to answer your questions. Well, thank you very much, Aman. There's a, uh, it's a complicated business. Let me just say that. And I'm glad there's smart people like you and your team to, to work on that. Just want to remind everybody that if you have questions to go ahead and um, put them in the question and answer section. Um, okay, I see there's one. I'm going to go ahead and look at that. Um, somebody asked, can we develop a simple process with one or two steps to separate proteins and lipids from spent ends, but with good quality and purity for their respective value added applications, as the reduction of cost is a very important factor of industrialization? Yeah. For lipids, uh, yes. Uh, for proteins, I think it's, we tried two different methods, uh, salt added and alkali added. Alkali added gave better uh, recovery, but uh, I'm not sure if they're talking about uh, food applications or uh, probably for food applications, I'm not sure if they're really, really uh, in that quality that can be used. Uh, for food applications. Some of the times, for example, during recovery, if we are using higher temperature, uh, for example, double bonds can be oxidized. So that's not uh, sometimes good quality uh, fat, for example. Um, 
but other applications for sure, uh, for example, we did for uh, conversion into uh, the, the food applications commonly, I mean, they use rendering using water. Uh, <clears throat> so, but the recovery is really low compared to uh, when we do this kind of uh, removal with the, with the higher temperature microwaves. Yeah, it sounds like the, uh, you know, taking this waste product and using, using it for industrial purposes is, you know, has more potential than, than um, perhaps even a, a food stream. Uh, type thing, uh, given all the work that you've done. Um, yeah, actually, I think it's, uh, there are, there are, there is a potential to extract uh, proteins for, for food applications, uh, but I, I'm not sure the process we used will be suitable for, for food applications. Uh, yeah. For example, using microwaves, we used uh, um, higher temperature, so it's not that high, but it's higher enough to, to oxidize some of the fatty acids, uh, which are unsaturated. And so it will not be a, of that good quality for, uh, for food applications. Right. However, so for other industrial applications, it does make sense. Yeah, the process affects the quality for sure. And, um, but perhaps if there's an, you know, some value, uh, you know, a new process can be developed. So right. there's a question here about uh, which of the techniques or solutions you talked about uh, have made it to an industrial setting already. So you talked a little bit about scaling up. Yeah, so the, the conversion of lipids into um, monomers, uh, we call them monomers, you can call it chemicals basically. Um, so we break them down at the double bond uh, uh, for the unsaturated fatty acids and produce different monomers from there. Those monomers are used for uh, production of a variety of different materials for cosmetic or for other applications. Um, they are also used in, uh, in fuels, for example. Uh, so we basically break them down and made some polymers, uh, some monomers, uh, which we are testing for cosmetic application currently. So that process um, we have, we did scaling up and then uh, started a new spin-off company, uh, which converts uh, basically lipids, fats into different products. Uh, for the, uh, the proteins from, from feathers, for example, uh, we have tested them with the COSIA, help of the COSIA. COSIA is a consortium of oil sand companies. I think there are eight, nine companies in there. They were interested to use this technology um, for the remediation of tailings or water uh, because the, the new regulations uh, now in place say that they can uh, they have to recycle 80 percent of the water um, or more than that the, because fresh water uh, use is restricted now and therefore um, for the treatment of water or consolidation of tailing, if they can get uh, this material, uh, that would be, and one of the interest uh, was that since we have this as a core byproduct, probably it's the cheapest one we can use. And so they wanted to do a scale up trial. Uh, we did a 10 liter scale I showed you that was the uh, material prior from COSIA. Uh, the rep came and they looked at it and now we're working with the, the future energy systems and doing uh, work to further uh, it. Uh, next year, hopefully we're doing bigger scale trials uh, so that we can show that this works uh, very well on larger scale. So I, I'm curious, I'm just trying to wrap my head around it a little bit. You showed that diagram, you know, where the water came from the Athabasca River into the various ponds and then the, the process. So uh, how would uh, this technology that you've developed fit into that? Like, would it be a, a filter as that water is moving from the tailing ponds back into the, you know, to be recycled, that kind of thing? What, what is it, how does it, how is it applied, I guess? So basically, we'll use them as a powder and mix it after this separate. Um, so after the separation, we mix this as a powder. One of the good thing is that 
we use very low concentration of this, uh, this material uh, compared to the polyacrylamide. Polyacrylamide, they use very high concentrations. Uh, so you, you, you're putting a lot of polymer into, um, into this mixture. We use less amount of polymer and we mix it directly with, after the, they have separated, after the separation we do, we mix it with them and then let it settle down with the passage of time. So because it's an unrivaled protein, it can bind to different sites on the clay, for example. And so it will basically act as a flocculant and settle that down quickly and then release water. Uh, it also binds to some of the contaminants. So we get better clear water release to the surface and all other stuff actually gets uh, consolidated down. Uh, so during separation, when they have separated bitumen, they have this water or mixture or, or you can say cocktail, which they send to the tailing pond. We mix it at that stage. We do not have to have filter or something like that. Um, it's compatible with the current process they use because they mix a lot of polymer, uh, which is a polyacrylamide. And that polymer is... Um, then they send it to tailing pond where the, some of it settles down and then they take the rest of the uh, supernatant, some of it, and then use it for uh, some fresh water to mix it and then use it for extraction again. So uh, it's like a similar process where we will be using this bio-based polymer and it can consolidate better. We use less concentrations. It will give more pure water and that water can be recycled. Probably there will be no need to use fresh water uh, if we have better, pure, more uh, pore water, which is uh, right. received after consolidation. So it can almost be just a closed loop system, you know, where you're yes. recycling that water over and over again. Yes. And then once they take that water out, the tailings which are left down, uh, the requirement is that they can actually remediate that land and that land becomes useful for vegetation, for example. Now, one of the issues is that it does not get or develop that kind of uh, strength so that any kind of uh, equipment can go on it or, or do any kind of remediation uh, process. So if the strength uh, which is required for that purpose is achieved, then they can remediate that land, it can be useful for vegetation or um, other, for example. Uh, so that's, that's, that's the end goal that once that land has been disturbed, now you can remediate it and, um, and use it. It goes back to natural process. Awesome. So those are big, big tailing ponds, uh, which are there. If, if there is a process which can consolidate effectively, uh, there, is, there are two advantages, get clean water, they can recycle it and remediate the, instead of adding more lands and increasing that footprint, reduce that. Yeah, it solves a few pains for the for the oil industry, for sure. And also for the poultry industry. And I think that's the piece, you know, it, it uh, we get excited about the outcomes, but I think also for the poultry industry, it's exciting in that uh, we are using, um, or, or at least converting what was once waste into something that might now have some value, um, you know? And so I'm curious a little bit about that, how, um, how do you get the feathers and like how much feathers, you know, uh, what is the um, efficiency of use, if you will, of the feathers? You know, can, can you deal with all of Alberta's feathers uh, in some of these uh, technologies? Uh, we did some, some initial analysis to find out the efficiency of uh, one gram, for example, of uh, absorbent or feather after modification, how much water it can treat. So obviously we need really small amounts of uh, feathers to treat the water which is um, contaminated with metals, for example, because metal contamination is less compared to uh, generally we see for other industrial processes in oil sands. The oil sands major issue is uh, metal along with naphthenic acids, which are um, toxic acids, uh, which, which actually prohibit the reuse of, of uh, 
uh, or or uh, release, release of water into other, uh, for example, bodies. Now, if we have to reuse it, if we have to use it for the removal of metals and uh, and uh, naphthenic acids, in that case, we don't need really huge quantities um, of the uh, sorbent. But for consolidation, we need more. So uh, it's it's basically um, when we go to larger scale, we will know at this scale, we use uh, less concentrations compared to what they use currently for acrylamide. But if we look at the feather availability, we have a uh, lot of feathers available. And I think uh, tailing uh, industry, when I had first meeting with them and presented, they, they had first question, do you have enough feathers available in Alberta which can be used for this process? And I told them that the quantities we currently are using as, are low. So we have a lot of feathers available, but we will exactly know when we go to a larger scale and see uh, how much quantities we will need for that. My understanding is that we have enough feathers available in Alberta, which can be used uh, for the remediation of this tailings and uh, also the water treatment. I muted myself. Uh, that, that's awesome. I mean, it's, again, to, to be able to find uh, use for that. Uh, we have a question here about can uh, this kind of technology be used to purify water for livestock use? Are there other yes. ways? That you can yes, uh, yes, yes. So um, I did not present. Uh, we we did some work with, uh, with the water for poultry use. Uh, to, to feed chickens, for example, uh, they had issue with metals and also some of the microbes. So um, I had some results. Uh, we did work uh, with the Alberta chicken producers, I think uh, Rob, and uh, we did some work on the removal of metals from uh, that water. Uh, th that really uh, effectively removes metals. And we are now working to uh, modify the keratin so that we can also remove pathogens along with uh, with uh, metals, uh, so that it can be used for the treatment of water for for poultry use. Um, and uh, other industrial water, we have looked at the water which is uh, used for the washing of, uh, for example, vegetables or uh, those water also have some contamination, pesticides and those kind of stuff. So we're working to look at how effectively we can uh, use this to remove those contaminants. So it basically has a uh, capability because it's a unique material you have. Now, you, you know, this is a hetero, we call it heterobiopolymer because you have different uh, amino acids linked together. Um, and those amino acids have different properties. Now, conventional biopolymers, which are used for treatment, they, they are one type of mm -hmm. material. You take one monomer, you polymerize it. We call it homobiopolymer, or one type of materials. This is a material which is heterobiopolymer with different type of amino acid linked together. And those amino acids have side chains, which have different functional groups on it. So it has a multi uh, zorbent capacity, can remove multiple contaminants. And therefore, small amounts of this can remove much, much uh, higher concentrations of metals or other contaminants compared to other technologies which are used for the removal of uh, contaminants. So yes, it has uh, potential to be used. Yeah, the mind almost boggles when you think about the number of ways that uh, water can be sort of reused and recycled uh, if it were to be um, decontaminated. So there's, there's a, I think, potential for a lot of uh, applications. One of the questions, you keep using the words sorbent. So usually we hear absorbent or adsorbent. Um, and so I'm wondering about things like, you know, when I think about things that are absorbent, uh, I'm wondering about things like litter, poultry litter and things like that. Can you use it to pull out things like ammonia out of poultry litter or things like that? Uh, can it be applied as a 
powder just like you would in the tailings ponds and where it pulls that that ammonia out of the air or, or that type of thing I, i'm just i'm forgive me i'm exposing i'm being vulnerable here i'm exposing my my ignorance but i'm just kicking around some ideas uh yeah so uh, we it's a it's a between adsorbent or absorbent so um it's something which can uh take material um so basically for adsorbent for absorbent something is going inside for adsorbent is on the surface so it can actually act as adsorbent we call it adsorbent when we are having both uh, adsorption and absorption phenomenon and also we differentiate between chemi and physisorption so something which is chemically attached something which is physically attached so it has both capabilities it can attach chemically as well as physically some of the contaminants so we would generally use it as a sorbent uh to be more broader right because yeah. it can do both yeah right i hear you so could you use it as something like a for ammonia or something like that uh, we may have to modify it to make it fit for the adsorption of ammonia yes um we've not tested and i'm not sure if in the current state it will work uh for the adsorption of ammonia okay. but there is a potential that can be used if we modify it oh interesting interesting uh i thought there was a question there i don't know i i guess it's gone um we have one more uh one minute left did you have any ideas that you or any challenges that you want to put out to the industry to sort of say have you thought about um anything like that where you think uh what what if we looked into uh these kind of uh possibilities in, in um how this technology can be used you know you talked a little bit about using it for uh uh water decontamination for for poultry and i love to hear that you know the idea of using it for pathogens is an option um any other ways that you think maybe the poultry industry could support you or uh in, in the work that you're doing yeah i think it it will be um it will be great if we can move it to industrial level because um it's it's a unique material um you look at the composition it's totally protein we have some moisture and very little amount of some wax or whatever and then rest is total protein so it's not like we don't have any extraction process for this directly going into uh as a use so there is there is no co much cost associated for uh for example for conventional protein extraction or that kind of we just dissolve it it's a protein uh we use it directly and uh if we uh, use it for water treatment i think that's a huge huge um benefit for for not only for poultry industry but also for other industries where water treatment is a challenge um and this can actually generate much more value for uh for poultry industry in addition to the other industries where they can take benefit uh, from it but uh, i think if we are able to which we are working on we are able to prove it a single uh uh treatment technology uh, which removes organics including pesticides uh, removes metals and microbes then it's a, it's it will be a kind of universal technology which doesn't exist yet um and we have seen a lot of progress both on uh, organics as well as metals and now we are focusing on we have some results but uh, it's early stage so we are focusing on um the removal of contam uh, uh, microbes so if it acts as as uh, a material which removes all three contaminants or different type of contaminants this will be a new technology into the market for 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 sure yeah for sure it's exciting